OK, I think we can make a start. And I'm sure other folks will join us. So um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, to this um, Participate with Recirculate International Partnerships webinar. The theme for today relates why are international and African pa research partnerships or so innovation partnerships challenging? And can it be made better? So we are hoping that at the end of today, we'll get to understand international research partnerships a lot better. And before we proceed, I'd like to give, give some uh, house rules. So um, based on our past experiences, we get interruptions from folks who maybe forget to turn off their mic. And so because of that, we've decided to turn off everybody's microphone at the beginning of the webinar. So if at some point you want to ask a question, as the case might be, uh, just raise up your hand and the the guests or the um, the partners managing the webinar on the back end would unmute your mic then you can actually speak. Also, would appreciate it if you are not uh, actually a, a panelist or speaking today, if you don't mind going off video, at least for the time being, and let only the panelists be shown, that helps with different things, including the editing of the, the video recording uh, for the use of others after the webinar. That'd be much appreciated. So um, um, we are looking to explore international partnerships, but I'll give some background, if I may. So fundamentally, one of the biggest challenges that sub-Saharan African universities and research organizations face is a huge gap between academic research and private sector, industry, and even government. And as a matter of fact, by either geographical or operational disposition, African universities and research uh, organizations seem to be cut off from industry, and this has affected its relevance, its capacity to produce high quality and employable graduates, and also the capacity to produce goods and services that can solve actual societal challenges. And I think there is no arguing that there's a huge gap between scientific research and industry in many countries in, in Africa. And this provides an urgent need to design policy tools or knowledge transfer programs mm -hmm and pathways that impact or ensures a new era of impact-oriented research and innovation in African countries. And at the heart of this, believe it or not, is the need for strategic, equitable partnerships and collaboration for societal transformation. And an important question that, that has been asked, why African academics and researchers do not collaborate with industry? And the question is, is it because they operate in different worlds with little or no mutual benefits or interest? Is it because there is no industry partners for them to actually collaborate with in the first place? Or is it just a question of institutional uh, blockages or obstacles? It's becoming clear, however, that there is that mutual interest when this, this segment of society, industry, academia, government, when they do partner. And as a matter of fact, there is also the need for most universities would usually use this, these opportunities to increase, if like the employability of graduates through student internships and many other many models. I guess today, um, very importantly so, as Sub-Saharan Africa experiences private sector investment and improvement technologically across a wide range of sectors, there is a need for national policy considerations on sustainable partnerships that actually drives and considers equity, fairness, and sustainability. Currently, global models show that African universities uh, are, are, can be anchors in co-designing and supporting research-driven innovations, eco-innovation, if you like. But the point is, are they equipped, are universities equipped to deliver these equitable partnerships? And what are the models that exist that can be adopted and or adapted as the case may be? And so we're hoping that we can explore this in a range of ways today. And we are so fortunate to have on the panel a list of incredible, and I mean incredible speakers, who would run us through this. I'll be introducing them as I call them to give their talk, and I will be having a series of interactions as the webinar progresses. First and foremost, it gives me an absolute pleasure to invite uh, the lead, uh, the principal investigator of the Recirculate and Actuate project, who is a professor of environmental microbiology with nearly 30 years of research experience. His main fields are uh, research interest includes fundamental processes of affecting organic contaminant uh, inter uh, butter interactions in soil, availability of organic contaminants residues in soil, risk assessment, and recently is focused a lot on the use of microorganisms to generate energy from waste or uh, for energy uh, uh, projects. 
He's a multi-award winner who has won series of funding from NAC, BBSRC, EPSRC, GCRF, and a range of other bodies. And currently, he will be giving us an introduction into the framework of the project, which is the host of this webinar. It gives me absolute pleasure to invite Professor Kexempel to open the floor. Over to you, Prof. Thanks very much, Akan, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, you know, thank you so much for joining this uh, this webinar. Something that's very, very close to my heart, and I, I hope um, uh, this generates further discussion um, going into the near future. Anyway, Akan, so I'm going to share my screen. I have a short presentation, as usual, and just let me know if you can if you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, yes. so I'll put it on presentation mode again. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Proceed, please. OK, so um, participate with Recirculate, the art of collaboration. And uh, at no point has this been uh, you know, more relevant than for today's um, webinar. So um, as I kind of said, my name is uh, Kirk Semple. Um, I'm the director um, of the Recirculate Nitrate projects, which I'll be you know, giving a brief intro to. But I also have a, um, a keen interest um, in international um, engagement um, and strategy within uh, Lancaster University. Um, well, just let me. So yes, um, as as Akans already highlighted, this is um, a webinar which focuses on international partnerships and collaboration, and really to explore the challenges and, of course, the opportunities for research and business partnerships. In, in Africa. Um, and it, I think it's safe to say that um, we at Lancaster, with colleagues in Africa, have been working on this for, for you know, at least 10 years in some cases. Um, it started off thinking about, you know, the linkages between the university sector and the, the private sector. But as we've explored this, um, and, you know, over time, it's be become a part that in you know interactions and engagement with government and policy are very important, um, and of course how we engage with um, the communities that we're working with, um, and of course civil society as well, um, and of course one of the key elements of this within this this sort of global eco innovation space that we are operating in at the moment is the idea of co design co-develop and co-deliver of projects and ideas through equitable partnerships. So this is really couched within um, the circular economy, which is gaining real momentum in sub-Saharan Africa now. It's stimulating a lot of discussion in the UK and how we can bring those, those, those two large groups together. Um, but basically, the circular economy is, is where um, waste and resource management can uh, contribute to a more resilient environment for human well-being. Okay, so the idea of that waste shouldn't be considered as waste and thrown away, but actually could be um, reused, recycled, and actually reduced within our activities as within society. And through our partnerships with um, African uh, colleagues. We're looking to support new partnership-based approaches to enable researchers, not only in Africa, but also in the UK and at Lancaster in particular, uh, to go transformational impact through working with and in for um, communities. And within the sort of eco-innovative space, we're looking at the development of new products, processes, and interventions and services that deliver benefits, not only for society, of course, but um, the wider and, um, environment. So Recirculate, um, most of you will have heard of it, about this. This is a project that's entitled Driving Eco Innovation in Africa, Capacity Building for a Safe Circular Water Economy. It's much easier to say Recirculate than give it its full title. It's a large, um, multinational, international project funded by uh, the UK uh, government through the Global Challenges Research Fund to the tune of around £7 million. And it really brings to be, to, together partners from uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Malawi, Zambia and Botswana um, to address uh, the, the aims and objectives of, of this um, 
project, but it also at its heart considers um, a number of UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, I haven't got time to go into those in any sort of detail, but I've sort of highlighted those along the bottom of the slide. So what does it look like? Well, in essence, it's broken down into different sections of a sort of virtuous circular economy where we're looking at how we can um, use waste, which we would normally throw away and actually then has impacts on us and our health and, of course, the environment, um, as, as a resource to um, produce um, energy. OK, so we, we're taking that waste and we're using it to produce energy. We're removing it from um, the, the environment and therefore that has positive impacts on health and sanitation. And through the processing of this waste, we can produce valuable uh, products in the form of biogas, which we can convert to useful energy. But also, of course, as with any process, it produces waste in the form of digestate. And of course, instead of just throwing that away, as, as does happen, we can we can take that waste, use it as a resource and feed it into um, the agricultural and, and soil security um, themes to as, a, as either a, an irrigation, um, a source of irrigation or indeed as a sustainable alternative to conventional inorganic fertilizers. And that that allows us to produce food more sustainably. And of course, as with um, the uh, the bioenergy element it also produces waste, which then can feed back into the the virtuous cycle, and therefore we have this this complete uh, circular economy, okay, which benefits a number of people um, in very many different ways, of course, and that that's all very good, of course, but but really um, at the heart of 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 this pro and other projects is is how do we use these to deliver impact, actual meaningful impact that benefits society and the environment. And so other components of um, Recircular include engagement and knowledge exchange with different stakeholder communities. And of course, this webinar is an example of that. And to extend that, how do we actually think about the, the sustainability of this circular economy? through entrepreneurial and innovative thinking. So valorizing um, waste, giving it a value, and from that we can actually look to develop business opportunities which will help sustain and extend the activities from the project in the real world. But for me, one of the most important things is actually how do we sustain that beyond that sort of entrepreneurial um, envelope? And how do we actually assist or help to support cultural and ultimately generational change. And for me, engaging with young people who are in essence the, the real change makers here, um, whether they're students at schools or at university or just you know in the in the, the communities that we're working with, and um, this is really very important. So how do we do that? That's a really big challenge. Um, but one of the ways that we're attempting to address this is through the second project, the so-called Actuate project, again funded by the UK government under GCRF. And the full title is Accelerating the Adoption of Circular Sanitation Demonstration Systems for Improved Health Outcomes. OK, so what that's allowing us to do is to take the research from the Recirculate project and actually start to operationalise it through the construction of two um, sustainable demonstrators, one in Ghana at um, the Umar Bun Hattab Islamic School in Accra, oh. and the other, of course, is in the uh, at the uni uh, University of Benin uh, campus um, in, in Nigeria. And from, from this, we, we can use, this as, uh, the, use these as positive case studies to highlight the solutions to waste management, improved health, sustainable energy and food security, of course, which we've already talked about, and um, how we can look to develop educational and capacity building elements, hoping to gain acceptance, generational and cultural change, and the, the embracing of the circular economy. And finally, as I, I mentioned in the previous slide, the development of new entrepreneurial business models to maximise um, economic benefit 
um, across the piece. Um, so really, um, just to finish off, um, I'm, I'm really very excited about this, this webinar. It's bringing together some very important people um, some senior colleagues from, from Lancaster, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Steve Bradley, of course, who's been very involved in international partnership development over the years, and Professor Simon Guy, a relatively new uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Global, who is, is, is leading the, uh, the, the new activities in, in, in the global and uh, international collaborative space. Of course, we also have um, good friend and colleague, Professor Lawrence Ezimonye, not only the, the, the Vice Chancellor of Igbenidian University, but also a significant lead um, in Nigeria for Recirculi and, of course, for uh, the Centre for Global Eco-Innovation. And then other colleagues who we've had the pleasure of meeting over time, Dr. Feli, Dr. Maximus, and of course, Dr. Edu, who have all been engaging with the Recirculi and Lancaster University projects, over, over the years. So it's wonderful to have everybody on here and I really do hope that um, uh, this is a really enjoyable and engaging webinar. So on that, I'd just like to hand back to Akan um, to, to take us to the next step. So thanks very much, everyone. So um, thank you very much, Kirk. Much appreciated. Um, it's very obvious that this project wouldn't have been possible without international strategic partnerships. Uh, and so um, on the first note, therefore, it gives me absolute pleasure to invite our first speakers, which I, I think they would do a double act in some sense, which would be fantastic. So that's I want to invite uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Lancaster University, Professor Steve Bradley, and the Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Handling Digital International Sustainability and Development, <clears throat> to give us a presentation respect to, you know, the Lancaster University partnership experience. It must have been an experience. I think the partners in Africa would like to know about that. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you, Akan. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, Simon and I will do a double act. In fact, he will manipulate the slides. I will <laughs> talk, and then he will both manipulate the slides and talk. So he's <laughs> he's going to be much more skilled. Um, so I'll wait for you, Simon, to... Really? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm trying. I've got the dreaded um, flashing circle at the moment as it searches to share content. So uh, I'm doing I'm doing my best, but at the moment it's not coming up. All right. Well, let me say a few words of introduction. Yes, please. Slide, um, so formerly I was the Pro Vice Chancellor International, and in fact I've met um, some colleagues who are already in attendance today, including Lawrence. So hello there, Lawrence again. Um, <laughs> I, I'm now Deputy Vice Chancellor and have a kind of peripheral uh, role in terms of the international agenda with supporting Simon. I think the first thing to say from a Lancaster University perspective is, you know, in, in keeping with the experience of lots of universities across the world, COVID uh, and the pandemic has had a significant impact on the finances of many universities. However, one thing to make clear from the outset is Lancaster is still very firmly committed to its international ambitions and to grow international partnerships. Uh, and I will talk about how we've done that in the past and where we've got to. And then Simon will uh, go on to how we're proposing to progress this area in, in the future. Recirculate is is part of that story but it's only one part of that story what i want to try and convey is is the breadth of what we've done and some of the lessons that we've learned so, so apologies I, steve uh, i've my i'm still just getting a, a circle thing uh, kirk are you able to put the presentation up <clears throat> simon, simon yes, i can um, do that yeah please alan yeah yeah thank you very much apologies okay no worries at all no problem. Let's see. So just for the guests to just join the call, please, if you're not actually a panelist or speaking, could you be kind enough to turn off your microphone and your camera, please? That'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank we you. Can start. 
that's slide one. If we move to slide two. Yeah, I'm just trying to move on. So I'm going to be, there we are. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Thank yeah, you. That, that's not our slide. Yeah, it's a different that's slide show. I could talk about that, but I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. It's <was> very busy. <laughs> Normally it's a lot slicker than this, so I apologize. Yeah, yeah. No, don't. The same problems. Whoa, there we go. That's, that's, the, that's the one. Okay. That's better. There we are. There All you right. go. There so we go. So, OK, so what we're going to do is essentially I'll pick up the two, first two parts of this presentation and then Simon will pick up uh, items three and four. Just to say that sitting behind one and two was uh, a strategy uh, that the university was and still is pursuing in large measure around becoming a globally significant uh, university. And that's both in terms of teaching, in terms of research, which is particularly relevant to colleagues today, and also engagement. So we'll go through uh, items one and two from me. So if we move on. Next slide. What we've been trying to do in terms of specific objectives within that overarching ambition to be globally significant is to do things differently. And, and this this slide just articulates some of what we've been trying to achieve. The, the key point to make about this is that when we engage in international partnerships, it's about research and staff collaboration and staff development. It's about the student experience. It's also about income. Uh, and it's also about raising our profile in geopolitically important parts of the world and through that, through to achieve that, collaborating with high quality institutions. We've engaged in this process of taking Lancaster off the campus now for about 15, 20 years. So we've been quite uh, experienced in all this. So if we move on to the next slide. Essentially, though, our international strategy has five parts and you can see those those five parts here and what I'll try and talk about are the partnerships which start from the teaching perspective but as is said on the right hand side of the slide we we want those partnerships not just to be teaching focused they have to have all three elements of what our university is about which is about teaching research and engagement with industry uh, business and government and I think that the genesis of some of the projects that we'll identify in some of the partnerships is that we've started with, with teaching in order to generate the resource base to allow us to move into the research and the engagement space. However, as the slide shows, there are also more explicit institutional level research collaborations. And I'll just say a few words about each of those, those in a moment. So if we can move on. Over that period of about 15 years, we've, we've had some very strong successes in creating significant partnerships uh, in what I would call geopolitically important parts of the world. And as I said earlier, most of these have started in the teaching space, so they involve undergraduate programs, some involve undergraduate and postgraduate programs. But then they've in, in more recent years, they've evolved into um, research and teaching and engagement uh, partnerships. And that would be true more of the Sunway partnership, um, whereas the partnership in, in, in Leipzig is a very new relationship. It's a new campus that we've created, which was a reaction to the UK leaving the European Union. So it was about giving us a base in the EU, really with a view to attract uh, European students, but interestingly, it's attracting international students as well, but also to give us um, access to EU funding. Now, that story has actually evolved a little further and 
uh, UK has access to EU funding via different mechanisms. The campus in Ghana is a venture which has been going on probably eight or nine years. In all of these, there are stories behind them. There's no single model. And one of the things just to say is that we've actually had two significant failures in terms of partnerships, one in India uh, and one in Pakistan, both for um, different reasons. And I guess that's led the university to think carefully about you know, when you engage in these relationships and these partnerships, you do have to also think about how you're going to disengage from those partnerships, because that can be a costly and, and messy experience. So these partnerships are institutional level. They're in some senses campuses of Lancaster University. Simon will say a few words about how we wish to develop this network. The next slide um, is more about institutional research collaboration. So in addition to the teaching led, which then develop into research collaborations, these were explicitly uh, attempts to create uh, research partnerships with different parts of the university. And building institutional research collaborations is the toughest thing. It's relatively straightforward to build teaching related partnerships, but it's extremely tough to build uh, research partnerships. And the reason is, you know, academics have their own agendas and it really does fundamentally depend on the chemistry between academics from the two or more institutions in order to get things going. Now, I'll say a few words later about how we've tried to, to do this. You can see, though, that we are trying to link with lots of universities from across the world. If I take an example of how what we've done on the teaching side has given us leverage on the research side, um, the relationship with Boston University, which is a very good university in the US, as you know, has actually been made possible only by virtue of the fact that we had a campus in Ghana. But that has opened up lots of research opportunities and student experience opportunities that have developed over time. Now, some of these relationships, you know, have waned a little, but others are still going strong, like the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And obviously, the recirculate partnership that you're, you're talking about today. So next slide, please. So how we um, how we engage in transnational education, whether it be teaching or research is is highlighted by these this slide here. And I'm not going to go through all of this, uh, but these are the kind of principles that underpin our approach, essentially sharing risk, protecting our reputation and being flexible in the way we partner. So, and one of the lessons I've learned is, you know, you shouldn't have a very, very homogenous model to partnership. It has to mould and blend with the regulatory environment and with the particular strengths of the partners that you engage in. Next slide, please. And just two, two final slides from me on what we've learned. Uh, well, it's probably more what I've learned actually about creating these partnerships. And if I think about the teaching initiated partnerships, there's a long list of things there. You know, we, we've kind of learned by doing in many ways. Um, and that's true of all partnerships. They, they evolve and you learn about your mistakes. But the two or three things I'd pick out from this slide are you do need local expertise to develop the kind of partnerships that, that you want to create, uh, especially on the teaching side. And you do need to pick the right partners. And I guess in the case of the partnerships that have failed, in, in the case of India, we were in, in the right country, but perhaps the partner had different objectives to ours. In the case of Pakistan, we had the right partner, but the regulatory environment within that country wasn't conducive. So, you know, partnerships fail for different reasons. I think the key thing that sits behind all of this is building teaching related or teaching initiated partnerships requires quite a cultural change within an organisation. Um, and what that means is you have to be willing to influence staff, you have to be willing to negotiate with staff, but you also have to incentivize uh, departments and staff to engage in, in those partnerships. 
Now, teaching is just one way in which we generate revenue in order to support research. So in terms of the next slide, our research focus partnerships are more challenging because what you really need, um, and there's a lot of things written on that slide and I won't, I won't go into it, but the two ingredients that I've found that are necessary to get these, these partnerships going on the research side is you need a champion. You need somebody who would be willing to invest their time and energy to motivate staff and bring staff along with the research uh, agenda. And then the second thing that you need is resources. And, you know, without those resources, the kind of things that people want to do, whether they be workshops or whether they be actual pieces of research itself, it needs resources. So universities have to support them in order to pump prime them. But what you also then need is for those partnerships, if they're to survive, to seek out grant applications and to give it long term sustainability. And in a get, in a sense, Recirculate has those three ingredients. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I'll pause and hand over to Simon. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. So, um, so Steve's given you um, a, a very uh, rapid um, review round, you know, probably what, 10, 10 or 15 years, Steve, of, uh, yeah. you know, developing and building these partnerships, um, some falling along the wayside. Um, but uh, as, we, as Steve has already shown you now, four now successful campuses, which are maturing and providing ver various kinds of benefits. And the sum total really of that, of where, where that's left, left Lancaster after 15 years, um, is as one of the world's uh, top uh, 100 most international universities, high in the rankings, uh, and only last year named the Times and Sunday Times International University of the Year. So the point I'm making, I guess, is that the overall strategic benefits to the university are beyond the success of any one individual project that if you can keep at this and be keep strategic and keep an overview about why you're doing it, the strategic rationale for why you're doing this, actually you can push the whole university forward. And I think that's something that's been achieved, uh, not by me, but by Steve and other colleagues in the development of Lancaster's strategy to the, this kind of point. So next slide, please. And what that's given us in one way as a kind of legacy now, you know, in, in terms of the a platform to kind of look forward is a kind of network, a family of global campuses now uh, offer operating um, not necessarily a full range of degrees, but increasing portfolio of degrees that are various uh, stages of developing um, research, as Steve has already kind of indicated. And for the first time, giving us the opportunity to think much more as what we call a transnational university rather than a kind of UK university with, with a kind of interesting hub and spoke international strategy developing uh, uh, campuses kind of one at a time something that is a distance to the UK campus. I think for the first time now in the next strategic period that we're just entering we have the opportunity to think of Lancaster quite differently as as very much a kind of joined up transnational connected global university. So next slide, please. And in relation to research, just to kind of further support the, the points that Steve's been making, why should we be particularly interested in international research? Well, one of the reasons here, well, one of the reasons is obviously because, you know, key, key global challenges now are exactly that. They're, they're global, they're international. We, we need to work collaboratively to solve them. But actually, there's also an advantage to the university in terms of research strategy because co-authored publications and 60% of the publications from Lancaster are co-authored actually are weighted much more higher than single authored publications. So in terms of extending your research power and your reputation, your ability to work and publish and research collaboratively on an international scale is going to accelerate again the development of your university, build your strategic value and build your global reputation. So research, of course, is a good in itself, a good as an end in itself, but it also again adds to the reputation of the university. And it's these kinds of qualities and returns that Lancaster is now starting to see beyond any kind of return in terms of individual income from kind of fees from students. Next slide, please. 
The other thing, of course, it gives you is the opportunity to de develop um, student mobility. So we're very interested at Lancaster in terms of Lancaster graduates, giving them a chance to be to learn to be global citizens. So the opportunity to be able to travel to our partners and experience um, um, life in different countries and different universities is of real value. And again, the fact that we have this campus network now means that we have a, a much stronger platform than we did in the past, past to develop the, the these kind of pathways for our students. And as the world changes and uh, some funding streams come and some funding streams go. It gives us actually a kind of power to look beyond the immediate challenges and develop a longer term strategy for our student mobility, working with our partners who see who see the advantages from their perspective as well and build that into the offer of what it means to be a Lancaster student and get a Lancaster degree. And for employers in the future thinking what kind of graduates come from Lancaster? Global citizens is what is is, is our aim. Next slide, please. So that brings me to some of the newer things, which perhaps less of a feature of the past strategy and also reflects the responsibilities that I have. Um, so in my title is PVC Global, but within that, I'm responsible for our overall international strategy, which is the responsibility Steve had in the past as PVC International. But I'm also our lead on digital and also our lead on sustainability. And um, when I was first appointed into the role, people were asking me questions like, you know, well, how much time do you spend on each? Um, which is not, not something I could answer uh, uh, straight away. And what I found as I've eased into the role is that actually that's a very much a false division. What I'm seeing now is digital is being woven right the way through our international strategy and indeed through our, uh, through our approach to internationalization. And of course, we've all come to realize that in the last year um, as we've had to deal with the global pandemic. And everywhere we've kind of been forced to teach to pivot online. Um, we've all done that in a kind of in the beginning in a kind of an emergency way. But what we've all been learning as we've gone through that is actually that potentially there are some pedago pedagogical positives to teaching in a more kind of blended way. And, and one of the one of the real advantages we found is that actually it's brought us closer to our partners. So a kind of shared shared challenge. Uh, we've supported each other in terms of pivoting digitally and, and what we found is it's providing new opportunities to kind of collaborate to the degree that our partners now are asking us about how we will sustain some of the kind of digital and online teaching into the future as a feature of our collaboration. And the same of, true, of course is true of research. So I'm, I'm sure in terms of the Recirculate project as well, Kirk could talk about the way he's had to think about the project. You've all had to collaborate very differently, but the researchers has has, has kind of been sustained through this period. Sure, we'd all like to be able to meet up again kind of face to face, but I think there's a great deal of learning to be done about the way that digital can, su can support our collaborative partnerships, um, both in terms of teaching and research into the future, so we can extend and intensify our collaboration to the future. So one thing I would suggest from our presentation today is a kind of really clear consideration of the role that digital may play in terms of collaboration into the future. Next slide, please. And I mentioned sustainability uh, as introduction as well. So uh, Lancaster University has now declared the climate emergency, which is a kind of uh, public statement that we see this as a global emergency, and we will looking we are looking to respond to that, both in terms of our contribution to uh, meeting that emergency, but also looking at, at the, the, the the carbon carbon intensity intensity of our own activities, uh, our teaching and learning and research, and obviously as a very global international university, they are quite considerable. So we're having conversations in the institution now, for instance, around business travel and how we might think about that in the future, how we might do a bit less of it, how we might travel differently, and again, how we will use digital um, to, to um, replace some of the travel that we used to do in the past. So it's certainly not a case of thinking, you know, we're not going to travel at all. We're not going to engage physically. Everything will be done digitally. We have no interest in, be in becoming the open university, as interesting as that institution is. We will continue to be working face to face and physically when that's possible. But we very much see our future in a blended kind of way, taking the positives of digital and blending that with the positives of face to face. Um, and so that's a key part of our strategic conversations at the moment, generally as a university, but particularly in the relation uh, to the international. And I would suggest that's another kind of frame for the discussions today in the future, how climate change will make a difference to the way that we want to, to collaborate. 
Next slide, please. So taking all this together, really, the, these kinds of points here, which I'm not going to go through, but they echo in one way an early slide that Steve shared with you, you know, thinking back to the strategy 10, 15 years away, ago, in many ways, the strategy itself, the kind of strategic imperatives haven't changed. What's changed in a way is, is our learning, but also the world itself. And these considerations of thinking of projects, not simply as kind of single standalone projects, but thinking about them in the round uh, as a joined up strategy and thinking very much about how Lancaster's strategy within the UK connects together and reinforces our international strategy. So really taking the international and bringing it home and taking our home strategy and internationalizing it. That's what we're looking to do in the future, partly uh, taking the benefits of digital to do that and partly as a way of mitigating some of the challenges of climate the climate emergency as part of the context, which wasn't there as strongly when well, it was there 15 years ago, but we weren't as aware of it. We, we didn't perhaps take it as seriously as we might have at that time. Um, we do now. So that makes a huge difference to how we think about the future. So final slide, please. So looking forward now, and we've just more or less agreed the new university strategy, and I'm now busy working on an international plan to complement that international strategy. And these three points start to give us a kind of a flavor, really, of some of the kind of key components of that new plan, which builds on the experience that Steve shared with you over the past 10, 15 years, but really starts to look forward in this new world that we're all now inhabiting and also building on the platform that Lancaster's created through that through that previous international plan. So we're looking now to utilize what we now see as a global network of campuses to enhance uh, cultural diversity, look at opportunities for staff and, and student mobility, grow that research intensity, and that can be between, between Bale Rig and our campuses and between those campuses. So at Sunway, for instance, in Malaysia, we've launched uh, jointly with Sunway a Future Cities Research Institute. You can absolutely imagine work between Sunway and Ghana and, and Bale Rig in the UK around that agenda. And we will also be looking to develop new courses, and that includes new blended courses, so courses which may be taught partly online, but will also include elements of face-to-face -face as, as well. And only yesterday I was in conversation around that, around some of our executive management programs, and the opportunity we have there potentially for students to be able to connect in a degree like that, working with other students in different countries and spending time across our different kinds of campuses. So really exciting developments. Um, to reinforce the point about kind of digital fluency, open new ways of learning and working, which will expand that uh, student experience, but also will really underpin that greater enhanced connectivity between our campuses. And doing all that finally in the light of climate change, thinking about the way that we moderate our travel, questioning um, the dominance of a kind of flying faculty mode and looking for a more blended approach to how we teach and research on our international campuses, and also how we use our campuses themselves as laboratories um, for, for sustainability as well. So we talked there particularly about Bellrig, but also we're having conversations with our partners uh, around our other campuses in that, in that space as well. So I think we've probably used uh, as much or maybe more of our allotted time. So thank you for listening and I'll pass back to Akan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve and Simon. That was actually fantastic. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I live in Lancaster. I've been in Lancaster for a long time, but I'm actually getting to hear uh, a very, very, very powerful overview. And I think, I think the point you, you've raised really is very important, especially for our partners on, on the call, is the fact that partnership work on an institutional level almost has to be intentional and strategic. You might find the odd ones where people just get into partnerships just by chance. But for you to be sustainable, have a long-term effect, it has to be touched through carefully because of the risk involved in those kind of partnerships, which I find very interesting. But you mentioned another very good point, which I want to say, the importance of champions. And for some reason, maybe planned or, uh, or, or, or by default, as the case may be, our speakers today, in one form or the other, are actually champions, which is the reason why, in some sense, they are actually able to speak to what they'll be speaking about today. And you will hear it very shortly. There are champions, and that is very important, especially because a university or a research organization is usually very multivariate, multi levels. And people have got different interests and, and even like their, their own priorities and drivers. And so, what you want is that individual or a group of individuals who can actually hone holistically these different elements together and drive the strategy 
to actual sustainability. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Stephen uh, Simon. Now, if you've got any question, please. I don't know how long the, the, both gentlemen actually have on the call, so, but if you have any question, just drop it in the chat section and we'll find a way to get it to them, for you can get a response to those questions. Because I would imagine that what you've uh, spoken about has kind of raised, if you like, some queries, some questions in the minds of institutional partners who are looking at their own partnership strategies. And it would be nice if you are able to respond to those questions. So thank you very much. Now, I do yeah. want to move to the next person. Uh, it, uh, so the next person who's going to speak about maybe a bit more different kind of partnership. And in this sense, it's a partnership between academia and industry. What he has termed the valley of death. <laughs> Sounds very scary, like a horror movie. But the point is, I think it's important we also understand why that is important. So I want to introduce uh, the current vice chancellor of the first premier private university in Nigeria, Ibnidon University, who is a professor of ecotoxicology, environmental forensics, and with over 35 years of research experience. He's a multi-award winner, including an award from the Ford Foundation, the World Bank, the United Nations, and a range of others published over a hundred papers uh, and, and, and in international journals. He's the former and now fellow of the Nigerian Environmental Society, a fellow of the Solar Energy Society of Nigeria. My goodness, he is a fellow of many organizations. <laughs> so it gives me absolute pleasure to invite my friend and boss, Professor Lawrence Ezemoye, to talk to us about the Valley of Death. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, find out from uh, Alan if I'm the one sharing my slide or if I have the permission to share my slide. Okay, I think I, if I, I can. Alan, yeah. is sharing, Alan is sharing already. So just say next slide when you're ready, Prof. Okay, that's the way to go. That. That's all right. Uh, I would like to say that I'm uh, highly honored to be part of this uh, high-level international webinar with eminent personalities like Steve that I've seen for a very long time now visually. I would like to mention that Steve's uh, footprint still been where we talk about the betting of the partnership between Black Asa University and the University of Benin. Again, I feel very privileged to be speaking on the valley of debt, academia industry partnership. The valley of debt, Steve, the next slide, please. Um, um, Alan, the next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, the valley of debt is a figurative speech. No, please go back. Go back to the first slide, please. Yes, the value of debt is a figurative speech that is veiled in allegory and illustrated in metaphor. It is a gulf or receptacle created by the gap between the academia and the industry, research and business, or the gap between research and the enterprise. This valley has become a dump site or a sink harboring unemployment, underemployment, and unemployability. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, the regular questions that are asked, we Next slide. Next slide, please. All right, so I think we're having some trouble here. Which slide do you want me to be on, Lawrence? What you number? just left the prayer. Uh, go to the next slide that has to uh, do with it. Uh, the next slide that has to do okay. with it. Okay. Hold on, I'll join you okay. soon. Yeah. Hold on, I'll join you soon. Please. 
Can we go back? OK. Uh, apologies for this. Um, Lawrence. I think Lawrence is on mute. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you're, you're, okay. you're echoing. I can. Please. I can put up the first device. Please. I think Prof's on uh, two separate devices. So, Prof, you're on two separate devices. So, there's an echo. We can see you on two devices. One device. It's a, it's a, yes, it's a better. Yes, it's a better. Uh -huh. We can still hear the echo, Prof. Hang on, hang on. So I've got an idea. Hang on. This is the mute the mute the post of the second device. Please, can you give me the voice for the second device? Lawrence, do you want to try unmuting again? Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, that sounds great, Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was sorry about that. I was I was about that. I was I was about that. You can hear me now. Yes. Please, sorry about that. I was trying to ensure that I don't have a, a network issue, but I'll probably start by referring to the value of debt, which I described as a, a gulf or a receptacle that has been created by the gap between the academia and the industry. This valley has become a permanent dump, dump site or a sink which accommodates unemployment, underdevelopment, and unemployability, which is a new term now. Next slide, please. Are you hearing me? Please, the, the, uh, the one before this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. Before this, yes. Well, let me continue. Let me start by referring to frequently asked questions. One of that, those questions are, are university graduates in Africa adequately educated? The second question is, does university degree guarantee technical competence? The third question is, is graduate unemployment a serious problem in Africa? And the fourth question is, who drives the academia industry engagement? In an attempt to answer these questions, I'll be conferring with some aspects of the bag, conceptual background and what is currently prevalent in the African scenario. Next slide, please. One of the major problems facing African countries today is that of unemployment. It's a continental problem. African nations are currently faced with the tax of evolving new micro 
macroeconomic strategies to create wealth, to create jobs, to create employment, and to provide social returns. Has this been successful? Today, our graduates are largely termed publicly called unemployable products by industries. And these have made the tax of employment and entrepreneurship very difficult. There is an obvious disconnect now between human capital manufacturing factories and the employment factories. And this is very sad. Next slide. The under unemployment drama that is playing out in the African scenario is currently not palatable. African unemployment rate has tripled in the last five years and probably will get worse if we don't intervene. Available information has shown that, according to Africa Reporter 2020, one in every two Nigerians in, in this country's labor force, which is about 80 million, is either unemployed or underemployed. Unemployment rate has risen from 27.1% to 33.3% in the last quarter of 2020. Some of them are also COVID-induced. A population of 46.48 million are underemployed. This population is more than 34, Afri population of 34 African countries out of the 56 African countries. Unemployment rate is about 20, 26%. Unemployment refers to those who are underutilized, casual laborers, those who are on consolidated salary, those who are not even pensionable. And this is about 15.9 million. The South African situation shows an unemployment rate increase from 32.5% to 32.5% in the last quarter of 2020. Kenya recorded 727 youth and employment rate in the third quarter of the 2020. Next slide. This unemployment drama has been associated with the mismatch syndrome. The increase in graduate unemployment rate has been largely attributed to the mismatch between graduate employment, empl graduate employee skills and the skills required for the modern workplace. In other words, the graduate skills do not really fit into the market demand or industrial workplace. In spite of the de demographic growth in graduate output, there is no corresponding skill growth required for, for workplace performance. So the South Saharan Africa expansion in institutions, which we all know and is recorded globally, does not in any way correspond with a deployment profile. These are all contained in the valley of death. Where cognitive knowledge does not match market demand, there is an ultimate and mandatory emergence of the valley of death, and that becomes very imminent. In the valley of death, you have unemployment, you have unemployability, you have unrest, you have this, this, the, the, the depression, you have crisis. There is nothing that is not contained in that valley. And that is why it's described as the valley of death. All because of the mismatch between the skills from the academia and the demands in the industry. Is there a way out? Certainly there is a way out. I want to believe that the original thoughts of research and development without the idea of the de deployment was also responsible for this crisis. Next slide, please. Omar Bindri, former DG of NATEP, in 2014, highlighted some of these problems, the challenges, reasons for the mismatch, and it's still prevalent today. A weak technology-based industrial strategy, lack of innovation support, a weak policy focus, and even a weak strategic business planning skills within the academia. And they are all widening the gap. Next slide, please. 
What now demands our care is this triple helix model. This model was introduced in 1992. And it's the fallout of the disconnect between the academia and the industry. And this has triggered the need for the academia, the industry, and government to come together on the same table to close up the gap between the academia and the industry and also fill up the value of debt. A functional academia industry partnership not only guarantees national development, but it perfects co commercialization of research outputs and also provides social returns for the citizens. Next slide, please. The need for a handshake is now more than ever desirable to wage a formal war against unemployment. To encourage job mobility and social returns, the current wide divide between the academic and industry must be bridged. This will be help to strengthen the quality of university products. By extension, entrepreneurship quality will be improved, and the rising middle class will also be strengthened. Next slide, please. The authority of the University of Bidin saw earlier enough the wisdom for academia, industry, engagement, and partnership. And one of the first things we did was to enter into strategic partnership with Lancaster University and the University of Bidin. And this was better in 2012 with Steve Bradley, Keck Simple, Mark Smith, the former vice chancellor, and all other management staff of the University of Bidin. Next slide, please. There is a photographic reflection of the current partnership between the University of Bidin and Lancaster University. We, during this period, learned a lot from Lancaster University on how to engage government, how to engage the industry, and how to interface the university discipline into academia. Next slide, please. The overall benefit of the synergy between the academia and the industry for economic development can be achieved through strategic co-curriculum development co-delivery of those programs, co-location of the programs within the industry and the academia. And of course, the ensuing benefit is the co-funding of these programs. And the, that eventually removes the funding programs associated with the interface. The next slide, we'll be talking about current actions. I'm giving the conceptual background. And what are the next current actions gained from the existing partnerships, institutional partnerships. One, the Academia Industry Summit has been a recurring decimal and has been very effective. And I will say that even in the last one month, several universities within the Nigerian clan have been organizing Academia Industry Summits to ensure that this gap and this mismatch is really removed from the Nigerian economy. It is encouraging to note that course supervision of postgraduate programs are now on at the University of Binadon University. And this idea is part of the current action to bridge the gap where industry participants are co-supervising with the university lecturers for postgraduate programs of their choice. A new dimension is the introduction of the industry personnel and government personnel into the membership of the governing councils of the university. Again, at this point, they play a very significant role. Another aspect is the introduction of industry academia board of studies. In most cases, chaired by the industry partner and co-chaired by the academia. 
all in the bid to interface and to harmonize graduates and the demands of the industry. Endowment of chairs of interest is also the current action by universities, the academia, research centers to interface with industry and government. Establishment of incubation units in entrepreneurship unit centers is also in, currently operational in our universities. We have also developed special postgraduate programs for industry demands. They are tailored and bespoke for the industry solutions. Finally, the current action is to include SMEs and engage them properly with the activities of the academia through SME experience. Next slide, please. The game changer, which is currently required to decongest the value of debt, is the border crossing of the academia, industry, and government. Working in silos in the academia is no longer fashionable. We must integrate the industrial demands and needs in the academia. There is need for government to act by providing policy. And that's exactly what is happening now in the Nigeria University Commission. It is now mandatory for every university, tertiary universities, tertiary institutions in the country to have industry academia collaboration. As a matter of fact, at the last accreditation exercise for programs in university, there was a particular column in the template that scored industry academia partnership. Another game changer is the academic It's a combination of academia and entrepreneurship rewards. It must be encouraged. The entrepreneurship entrepreneurship activities require input from the academia. And this is where this measure must be encouraged. Standing alone on individual discipline does not really provide food on the table. But skills, set skills. And that is why at the University of Virginia and the Virginia University, Senate have approved that every discipline must have academic skills. Every academic discipline must have set skills specific to those disciplines. So the, gra the graduate comes out with the academic knowledge and also sets skills to perfect the act of the disciplines that is graduating from. The re-engineering of the curriculum in the universities have already started to capture the needs of the industry, to capture global needs and make the universities and the graduates themselves globally competitive. SMEs are now part of the entrepreneurship programs in the universities. SME summits, SME expos, SME interactions, and SME programs have now been developed in the universities. And this is one of the ways to make the SMEs part of the academia and help them to improve on their entrepreneurship skills. Deliberate government policies is also germane to decongest the value of debt. Government has already started, but they must also put it in the National Development Plan, which is exactly what we're doing now. The mid-term National Development Plan of this country, of Nigeria, has a deliberate portion, that has a specified portion, a dedicated portion that is mandating government to have deliberate policies on industry academia partnership. Industries on their own part to help decongest the value of debt must have skewed corporate social responsibilities. Skewed because we are talking about funding research, funding the academia, partnering with the academia, providing chairs, endowing chairs, and of course scholarships in areas of need. Such skewed corporate social responsibilities will assist. Collective responsibility is required. It's for all government, industry, academia, the youth, the old, the adult. Everybody was beginning to think about border crossing. Everybody's, everybody's res responsibility to decongest the value of debt. And to do this, there must be attitudinal change. And so on this premise, I would like to say 
that if we continue to emphasize this, the, the policies and the attributes of these game changers, the value of debt in due course will become a thing of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you so, thank you so, so very much. That's very, very comprehensive. And I think um, even though the value of debt sounds very scary, the fact is, uh, I think the fact remains that there's some, some specific actionable steps can be taken to decongest that value that, as you put it. I think I picked up a few points, which I think is very important. I think for those listening on the call and partners and from different countries, um, you know, um, having academia and industry get interactions, it's very, very vital. I mean, I, I, I usually call it the, the high gate phenomenon. The fact that the average African university, for some reason, they've got like very high entrance gates. And, and I think I remember somebody told me about the university that uh, tore down an already large gate to build an even bigger one. For some reason, there is, seems to be a connection between the size of the gate and the beauty of the university. But what it does, whether philosophically or psychologically, is kind of create a barrier between the university and also the users of, of university research, that interaction. So thank you, Prof, for breaking that down. I think as individuals listen, I think it has to be an international deliberate attempt to break those walls through partnerships. I want to call on the next speaker, but before I do that, I want to have an interaction in the room, if I may. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, uh, ask a series of maybe a couple of questions. And based on what you've heard so far, I mean, they might sound controversial, but that is intentional, just to get a feeling of the room, what people are thinking. So, uh, Alan, could you bring up the first Mentimeter link? So if you look at the chat section, you would see a small link that Alan had just posted. If you click on that link, it should take you to a Mentimeter page with uh, two multiple choice questions. And I want individuals to respond to those. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Fantastic. And the first question is this. In your view, I, I can imagine there'll be different answers to this. In your view, which of the following contributes significantly to graduate unemployment, in your view? And I'm sure most of this will be correct, but let's get a, a feeling of the room where people, people's focus or, if you like, people's um, uh, feelings are, 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 I mean, are facing. So if you just respond to it, everyone, please click on the link on the chat and try and respond to this just to get a feel for the room. Which, which of the following contributes significantly in your view to graduate unemployment? Is it government policy? Is it lack of skills, sets for work? Is it because of a demographic explosion with increased population, especially in different African countries? Is it curriculum deficiencies or just that academia industry disconnect? What are people thinking? Let's go. Please click on the link on the chat posted by Alan, and let's kind of get a feel for the room, what people are thinking. Okay. Alan, what happened? Feli, okay. can you stop sharing your pr presentation, please? Feli, could you stop sharing your screen, please? <clears throat> Feli. Thank you. So let's go back to the Mentimeter question. Please, uh, when it's time to share your screen, you will be told. So if, if you please, cl please click on the link on the chat and let's see which you choose, if you like, as to what you think is a significant contributor to graduate unemployability. A people voted. I can. We can actually make a choice. Well, at least I can. Why oh, is that? What's in front of me? There's no option to actually um, make a choice. That's yeah, right. I, I, I can't as well. Right. Alan, okay. was, can we? Can we right. That? That's my. That'll be my fault. I apologise. Um, just one second. Let me try and just, sort. Just one second, guys. Okay, I think every people are struggling to make a choice. I think we need to. Start. Yeah. 
Okay, you know what? Let's let's do this, Alan. Let's do this. Let's do this. We're going to come back to the Mentimeter question, but we have a few more speakers to get through. So if you get that prepared, and then we come back to it later. So I think I want to introduce the next speaker very quickly. And I think it's somebody you want to listen to because she does incredible job. And she will give us a sense of uh, partnership from a Ugandan experience. And who am I speaking about? The person I'm speaking about is she's a biodiversity and environmental management specialist. She got a PhD in environmental management from Makerere University in Uganda and from University of Oslo in Norway. And she, she got a joint master's of science botany from Makerere University, Uganda and Imperial College, London. She's got 17 years experience and about seven years in senior management and leadership and um, working in biodiversity, land degradation, uh, climate change. She's even worked at the National History Museum in London, National Museum in Kenya. I mean, she does incredible job. Um, she's currently the head of the Climate Change and Environmental Sustainability Program at the Africa Innovations Institute in Uganda. It gives me absolute pleasure to call on Fe Dr. Feli Tusime to give us a presentation about partnership dimension with respect to the, the work that she's been doing and the capacity of our institution in Uganda. Feli, you can proceed and share your screen now. We'll come back to the Mentimeters later on. Just, just, just be patient, guys. All right, over to you, Fali. Hello, you can see my screen? We can hear you, we can see your screen. Yes, please proceed. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I think it's good afternoon for most of us. Uh, my name is Feli and I work with the Africa Innovations Institute. So the Africa Innovations Institute is an NGO in Uganda, which was established in 2005. And we work in innovations development in areas of agriculture innovations, uh, sustainable livelihoods, and environmental sustainability. So we have a mission to undertake agricultural research and innovations that transform the lives and income of smallholder farmers, uh, while we are ensuring food and nutrition security, as well as environmental sustainability. And our vision is smallholder farmers enjoying income and assured of food and nutrition security. So we work uh, under different programs. We have four programs and there are different projects in each of these programs. We work with uh, different so partners. Hey, sorry, you know your screen is not moving. You're not moving your slides. Oh, sorry, I, I it's swear. moving this side. <laughs> it's not on this side. No worries, let me try again, Rishia. There you go, it's better now. I think it was, it was just a delay in the, in, 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 in the loading. All right, so um, what we do, we are working in different programs like I've mentioned, and each of these programs has different projects, and we are working with different partners uh, from different sectors, including academia, government, private sector, business, civil society organization, the communities, and, and with community-based organizations, as well as development partners. So uh, how do we establish these partnerships? We do this formally and um, using different tools, uh, for example, memorandum of understanding, and we also do contracts and subcontracts. We do non-disclosure agreements and, and also uh, engaging with the mutual consent. So here I share some examples of some multi-stakeholder engagements, and uh, of course we engaged in different uh, we engage in different fora, and both online and physical, including of course meetings, seminars, and workshops, boardroom meetings, as well as field activities. So here I'm sharing a bit of some of the tools we use: memorandum of understanding with government and also international uh, institutions. So you will see that for some of them, it's between African Innovations Institute and maybe one institution. But some of the partnerships like this one is a, a mutual non-disclosure, non-compete agreement. And uh, here we have uh, a multi-stakeholder engage, multi engagement, including business, academia, and of course, uh, 
a bit of development uh, partners. Yet another example of uh, partnering with international institutions. And then we just don't uh, partner with these institutions and promise to work with them, but we also keep our communication open to different uh, audiences and we package our messages in different styles depending on the audience. So for short communication, uh, especially for the non-technical audience, we use uh, fact sheets and policy briefs for the high level uh, audiences and technical reports and of course um, publications for the technical audiences, the academia especially and researchers. And then for the informal sector, we are aware that some people are not literate, so we, we, we communicate using pictures, picture charts, as well as uh, um, videos and drama. So some of them are actually face to face, but we have also kind of like uploaded some of this on, on the internet. I have an example on the YouTube. Uh, I've just put a link here of one of the examples where we are communicating with people from uh, one of our communities, the Kar Karamoja subregion, where the level of literacy is not uh, so high. So uh, we also use different medias in delivering our messages because we know different people can ac access uh, messages uh, in different ways. So we use the print, we use uh, radio and television, as well as social media. So uh, I'm giving, I'm going to share a, a short story of uh, one of our uh, multi-layered research partnership, and I will use the cassava story. So uh, cassava's partnership uh, started with the problem. We had the cassava mosaic virus, and in this uh, scenario, the challenge we faced was uh, Cassava, first and foremost, is a staple in Uganda. And then it was almost wiped out by the cassava mosaic virus in the late 80s. So government contacted uh, our CEO, uh, Professor Otim Nape, he's a, a plant pathologist, and they told him to kind of find a solution to the problem. Otherwise, the country was at a risk of a uh, big uh, food insecurity uh, challenge. So the African Innovations Institute uh, together with the National Agriculture Research Organization, uh, the National Agriculture Research, uh, Agriculture Crop Researches Resources Institute, as well as um, other partners, to start researching in a, uh, varieties which were resistant to the disease. So a number of varieties were uh, produced um, over years, and uh, these are resistant to the cassava uh, mosaic uh, disease, virus disease, and other cassava diseases. So after getting the good varieties, we also had to consider scaling up the seed. And here there was partnership with some private uh, laboratories like the BioCrop Lab, in addition to uh, the national laboratories. And here it was multiplying tissue cultures so that we are able to get a lot of material in the shortest possible time to be able to save the situation at hand. And of course, we worked with the communities to identify also during the testing periods to identify, uh, you know, acceptability of the different varieties such that we had what is acceptable uh, to the communities. So, this ushered in commercialization of cassava. So the cassava stem had to um, be multiplied in big quantities, and this meant that we had to establish a cassava seed system or a cassava seed business where we had to train uh, seed entrepreneurs into growing certified cassava planting material, clean planting material, and so we developed this chain and trained uh, farmers and uh, entrepreneurs who are interested in this. Of course, it took convincing people that you need, you can invest in growing stems for sale. And the farmers and, and some individual entrepreneurs were able to take this up. And this uh, developed into a seed system business. But again, here the seeds were certified by the Minister of Agriculture and, and Minister of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries. So here are some of our um, 
successful uh, uh, cassava entrepreneurs. And now, after we had solved the problem of uh, uh, seeds having uh, clean planting material, people were growing the cassava and a lot of roots came up. So there was need to actually provide market for these roots. And so Africa Innovations in Institute uh, proceeded in looking for market. And so there was engagement with uh, uh, different entrepreneurs now at the uh, processing stage. So a number of small medium enterprises were engaged and kind of convinced to explore cassava entrepreneurship in the processing and, and uh, the different value chains. So we managed to get a number of people who are willing to venture into this, invest their resources and pilot the, 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 the business. And so here I'm showing the examples of the different um, activities in that aspect. So we kept communicating our story as the process evolved, the commercialization of the entire cassava value chain. So uh, post the processing stage of the route, we were able to convince uh, some industry, a number of industries to consider exploring substituting the cassava flour, I mean, sorry, the, substituting the existing flour they were using with cassava flour, high quality cassava flour, because we also had to produce market uh, for, for the available cassava, high quality cassava flour. So a number of uh, industries were interested in piloting and we worked with them to develop these products and they were very willing to test uh, along the process until we were able to come up with products which were acceptable to the market and also certified by the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. For example, we worked, again, our strategy was also working with the big, uh, the big brands and as well as working with the communities. So we were kind of doing things parallel. You're working with the communities to uptake the products, the cassava flour, but you're also working with a big brand so that at the end of it all, when the big brands have kind of like uh, using this product, it becomes easier to scale out and uh, it's also very good for sustainability. So we worked with Britannia and we have biscuits on market, which is cassava biscuits. Then we worked with Hot Loaf Uganda, which is the biggest uh, 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 bread uh, industry. And of course, some of these are products from the small, uh, smaller uh, companies and communities. So another interesting product from the cassava is other drinks. So we've also worked with the Uganda uh, Breweries Limited, and here we piloted using um, cassava, high quality cassava flour to uh, produce uh, local brew. Uh, lo sorry, uh, local beer, and here uh, one of the most popular uh, beer today, Ngule, was produced. So it's interesting to finally have the once uh, poor man's crop cassava turning into a commercial uh, product. And uh, the, uh, there was a lot of partnerships, and of course, like. Uh, sponsorship from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we do thank all our partners, but uh, what is most important is these products have created a lot of livelihood change, created employment at different value chains, and also created um, uh, tax and all other benefits, as you can see, and most importantly, food security at the household. So here is our example that I am happy to share. It's a short story, but uh, kind of like really showing how we've managed to work with the communities and even post the project implementation, all these activities are ongoing and everything is moving on just like how we had envisioned it to be. Thank you very much. Wow, Feli. I mean, there's a reason why we asked you to give the representation. I think this story is very powerful. I mean, we, I mean, we speak a lot about research gathering dust on shelves in, in African universities and African researchers and institutions. But you've just shown a clear case of research for impact. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of feeling hungry. I'm thinking of cassava cake and cassava beef. 
in cassava biscuits and even cassava conflicts, maybe you call it cassava flakes, whatever. But I think it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I think somebody in the, in the, in the chat mentioned, uh, noted that, I think Munira says that, also important to know that cassava, food product from cassava is actually gluten free. I mean, I mean, you could go through the range of benefits, but it's a power of partnerships. Uh, if anybody's got questions for Feli, drop by a DM in the chat section and, and just, just understand how things can happen if you intentionally look for partners that can actually make things a bit more sustainable and also very, very, uh, very, very impactful. Thank you so much, Feli. And I know, uh, I, I know Professor Otim Napa is also on the call. Thank you so much, Prof. You guys do an incredible job. I, I mean, the next time I come to Uganda, I would absolutely love the range of this food because I think they sound and look absolutely sumptuous. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we can now proceed to the Mentimeter sessions. So it, as if you look back in your chat, this should work fine now. Um, just click on the, on, on, the, on, on the link and we can actually respond to the question. So we'll, we'll take Lawrence's questions first. So let's see how the room is feeling. And so let's proceed. So Feli, if you stop sharing your screen, then we can actually take the Mentimeters, please. Thank you. Fantastic. Really, really powerful what you guys are doing. Okay, so Alan is sharing now. Fun, so okay, we, we have the we have the um the polls coming through nicely. So which of the following contributes significantly to graduate unemployment in your view? So the people talking about so the government policy is a lack of skills, the demographic uh, explo explosion, curriculum deficiencies, or the academia industry disconnect. Wow, this is looking exciting. I think most people, so at the moment, academia industry disconnect seems to be a big, big, big significant contributor according to how the room is feeling. Keep voting, please. Then we'll move to the next question. I think overwhelmingly everyone believes or believes that the academia industry disconnect is the fundamental. I mean, if, 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 if that can be figured out, everything else can work, kind of work uh, in, in concurrently on the back of bridging that, that gap or eradicating or discongesting that academic, that valley of death. Okay, thank you, thanks guys. Just to get a feel for the room. That's really, really good to see. Next question. Now, the lack of skill sets in graduates might, I mean, it's, it's kind of a similar question, but let's take it in a different way. The lack of skill sets in graduates may be attributed to which of these factors? The lack of apprentice, apprenticeship schemes, availability of internships, the stagnance uh, of reduced funding, emphasis on theory rather than, 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 than practicals, or just staff mobility or brain drain. In your view, what do you think is a, a big contributor or attri attribution to the lack of skill sets in graduates? So it seems like we, we are going back to the same point here, which is quite good to see. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. So there's a focus around the emphasis on theory rather than practicals. You might as well, I mean, you, you could as well say that, well, that is probably because of the disconnect between academia and industry. And Keck rightly says all of the above, and it's very correct. <laughs> I think we're trying to get a sense of people's preferences or people's, people's feeling as to what might be the biggest contributor to the lack of skill sets. And I think it's very obvious that the emphasis on theory rather than practicals makes employers not able to adopt or uh, um, 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 employ graduates when they, they finish. So the, most graduates are even having, have, have to get retrained afresh to be able to be absorbed into industry because it's all theory and no practice. Thank you very much. I think, I think we have a sense of the room. That's really good. So the next question now is going to fill these questions. So if you go back to the chat, you can click on this and you see this question. And it's a very simple one. Why don't, so, so we obviously know it's very beneficial for researchers to partner with industry, but why doesn't it happen? So is it, is it because of ego? Is it because of um, no relevance or they don't see it's important? Uh, no access to industry partners. Interesting. Or there's no compulsion or there's no driver for them to partner with industry. What do you think? Why? Since it's obvious and clear that it's important and beneficial for researchers to partner with industry, why then, why then don't they? 
partner with industry. Please keep voting. Let's get a sense of the room. Please keep voting. Let's get a sense of the room. Why why don't researchers partner with industry? You, you just click click on the... So I think we're also getting some resonance from the chat. No compulsion to partner. That's very interesting to see. And I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, obviously, most of you know African researchers um, get promoted by the number or the value or quality or international profile of their research papers. And the question is, if 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 promotion was tied to or if promotion was tied to your partnership with industry, might it change the narrative? I think it might. And so that becomes a different level of compulsion that, that, that get, makes researchers go the extra mile to actually partner with industry for research impact, increased employability, and all of that. So I think the room is saying that that, that compulsion is an important aspect. Thinking about compulsion, my mind goes to policy. Since every academic institution, research organization, reports to in that's to government. They all report to government. So by government policy, can there be compulsion that researchers partner with industry if there is a clear evidence of the impact of that that that, that partnership? I think there could be. So it boils down to the, the need for really good policy tools and models to make it work. Now, last question before we move to the next speaker. Last question. And the last question is this. Who are usually the least engaged during a research project? So Feli was talking about a multi-layer dimension to their research at the African Innovation Institute. Partnership with SME, industry, community users. In your view, on a general level, who do you think are the least engaged during a research project's planning and design? Who are the least engaged in your view? Then we can move on to the last two speakers and we we'll hope to wrap it up quickly. So the least engaged, I think in the room, it seems like the, the local community is, 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 is topping. And I think there's probably a justification for that. Industry, obviously, other researchers, maybe in some, in most cases, probably the case. But I think, yeah, the room feels that local community. And it's interesting to know that these are the ones who need the result of the research the most, but they are the least engaged. Kind of put a new a new twist or a new dynamics to the equation. Why it's important for you to think about partnerships on a multi-layered level to be able to actually create impact and sustainability. Okay, so I think because of time, we'll move on to the next speakers. But thank, thank you so much for participating with that. If you have any questions, please remember to post them on the chat. I will try and pick them up as we proceed. I want to call on the next speaker, who is a good friend of mine. He's currently the C40 CT advisor to Lagos State government, where he's, he provides technical assistance to the city's political leadership and relevant ministries uh, to facilitate delivery of climate action in line with the Paris Agreement. He has had a flourishing career in Lagos State. And I remember I, I was actually a guest speaker at two of the, the largest international conference on climate change in West Africa, where he was the convener, uh, the climate change summit hosted by Lagos State government. He was the organizer, the host and the convener. And he's also, he also, also was the pioneer of the Lagos State Climate Change Unit, where he has executed several interesting and successful projects by in partnership with different international bodies. It gives me absolute pleasure to invite Mr. Maximus Ugoke to give us a short presentation with respect to the, the, the C40 Africa Partnership Framework, which I think is very, very exciting. Over to you, Maximus. Sorry. Can you hear me? Very, very clearly, sir. OK, can you share the screen or? So Alan, can to... you share the screen? OK. Yeah, I'll share the screen. Just let me know when you want me to move the slide, Maximus. Okay. okay. Fantastic.
Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, and it's my honor and privilege to to be here. It is equally exciting to reconnect with uh, friends and the colleagues whom I've met uh, so much, because of the uh, COVID. Um, I'm going to take us through uh, understanding the strategic partnership between Africa countries on the big agenda of climate change. As all of us know, climate change is a huge, huge issue, not only to Africa countries, but the entire globe. Next slide, please. And the agenda, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, C40, where I work, and where they made a compelling need for a climate action plan. Thereafter, I'm going to talk about uh, C40 partnership model and then the ambitious challenge, the big agenda for Africa. And finally, I will take us through the achievements we have made in that space. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, let me just say that uh, C40 came into being in 2005, and it was founded by Ken Livingston, the former mayor of London. He just decided to call together some uh, mega cities all across the globe for them to have an engagement centered around addressing the climate change challenge. The initial idea he had was to tell it after G40. And from what he told us, he said that he wanted it when uh, G40 is doing their meeting, they also be doing it in Paso. In other words, the world greatest emitters will be doing their meeting, the cities that are interested in addressing emission are also doing their, their own, their own um, engagement. Next slide, please. Next slide. I think there's a lag. Okay, I will present from my own slide here. So you just be uh, changing it as you deem fit. I will be changing from my from my computer. Okay. Do you want to? I'm not that? sharing it. I'm not. There's there's a lag. So. Masimos, can you share your screen then? Okay. Let me. No, I've never used. I'm used to Zoom. I never use the oh, I see. Right. before. So, I'm I'm conscious of time. Um, so, okay. Let me just uh, continue presenting from my my own uh, computer here, and then That's you will be changing as as I. Okay. So, C40 is a leadership group led by mayors focused on supporting 97 cities to take the urgent and effective action needed to confront a climate crisis and keep global heating below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So currently, we are in 95 cities all across the globe. And those 97 cities have confirmed that they are feeling the impact of climate change. This 97 cities translates to like 700 million citizens and one quarter of the global economy. So next slide uh, is uh, how we spread al across the globe. Africa, we are 13 cities, C40 cities in Africa, and Accra and Durban are member of the steering committee. You can see the picture of uh, our mayors scattered all across the globe. So part two is C40 partnership model. C40 believe very strongly that if you want to work fast, you work alone. And if you want to go very far, you have to work together. So this is a prism the fulcrum around which C40 ideology revolves. If you want to work fast, you work alone. If you want to work far, you work together. So we work together with our cities. So C40 is funded by donors, and member cities are judged by what we call leadership standards. And leadership standards, first of all, is that there must be a commitment from the mayor and the city to have a climate action plan. Two is that mayors and cities must accelerate transformational action 
be it in transportation, be it in energy, be it in waste. It depends on the peculiarity of the city with regards to climate issues. And of course, you must be willing to go together. You must be willing to partner with sister cities. And of course, you must be willing to inspire others. So these are the prisms around which uh, the climate C40 model revolves. Now, part three, the ambitious challenge, the big agenda for Africa. The big agenda for Africa, as far as C40 cities is concerned, is the climate action plan, the climate action planning program. And if you remember the Paris Agreement, US cities, US nations of the world, endorsed an agreement to limit global uh, temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre industrial levels. C40 has taken it upon itself to put a bite to that agreement. And that is why I have ruled out the Climate Action Planning Program all across the, the globe. So what it did is that it came up what we call the Line 2020 Business Plan. The Line 2020 means that every C40 city signed an agreement that between 2016 to 2020, they will have started developing a Climate Action Plan that is in tandem with the Paris Agreement. A whole lot of cities have developed this action plan, but some of us were affected by uh, the COVID. So the deadline has been extended to June this year. So these are the 13, uh, C40 is in 13 African cities, but currently 11 are part of the climate action planning process. Now, the hard work, evidence base. In all those cities where we work, we have equipped the city officials with all these capacities. An average city official that works with us has an expertise on greenhouse emission inventory, how to carry out emission scenarios, how to carry out climate risk assessments, because we do what we call adaptation master classes for them, how to carry out stakeholders' engagement, and how to do policy analysis. Then the action planning itself, the action plan itself, is an embodiment of action prioritization. Because you know, most cities have a lot of uh, climate actions, but there's a process uh, called multi sectoral analysis through which we prioritize action. So we build the capacity of city officials on how to do this. We also do what we call action definition. So all those prioritize actions, how can we translate that to action on ground? We do scenario modeling, stakeholder engagement, benefit analysis, inclusivity uh, assessment, inclusivity interaction with uh, other policies. We do governance framework, vertical integration, that is relationship between cities and the federal government. As a matter of fact, all climate action plans are, must be in alignment with the nationally determined contributions. And of course, we do implementation planning we monitor and evaluate, and they do a lot of communications because various cities has their peculiarities with regards to how they communicate their actions. So what have we achieved? And in talking about what we have achieved, I want to speak briefly about uh, Mayor Sowa, who is the mayor of Accra. Because for us in C40, and as far as Africa is concerned, the mayor of Accra is our poster boy. This is because he is very modern, he is very collaborative, he's urbane, he understands the subject, and he's very, very welcoming. So through him and from his mouth, he said that uh, the action planning process has been a valuable capacity building within the municipalities. And it has yielded unprecedented climate commitment and ambition, holistic plans, that is mitigation, adaptation, and inclusive climate action. And above all, it has succeeded in breaking down the silos because if you go to most cities, cities don't uh, seem to work together. But through the action uh, planning process, we've been able to bring cities together to share knowledge and to know that there is a joy really in sharing. Also, climate change is now being mainstreamed. 
through the action planning process uh, in cities. And of course, cities now take evidence-based decision-making tools. So what have we achieved? What is on display now is that uh, most cities across the globe have developed their climate action plan. Accra, for instance, have uh, developed and they're already implementing it on ground. In uh, Africa, Accra, Durban, the Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Swanee, they have finished developing their climate action plan. And then the rest of us have a deadline of uh, uh, June this year to develop, finish our own uh, process. Lagos, for instance, will be launching its uh, CAP on the 8th of June. So I uh, thank you. Very short uh, presentation. Thank you so very much, Maximus. I, th I think just listening to you speak, it's, 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 it's interesting to know that many things are happening, but except you know, or you've actually find out, you will know it's happening. So that, that, that kind of a strategic Pan-African partnership across different cities towards resolving the challenge of climate change on the continent, I find very fascinating and absolutely, absolutely interesting. And the fact that individuals can actually key into these, these frameworks and actually grow their institutional capacity, but also their, their, their individual knowledge base on how they can actually, in, in one form or the other, help their economies work with communities for the betterment of societies, but also to resolve the issues of climate change. So thank you so much, Maximus. I'm sure people would find, have questions for you. If you want to know a bit more about what Maximus is doing or to, to maybe connect with him, with respect to his Pan-African work, please send him a DM uh, or do us an email and we'll do the introductions. We'll also try and make the PowerPoint available to those who's, who want the PowerPoints, but also anybody wanting some more information with respect to today's presentations, we will be happy to actually uh, present that to you in the form of a recorded video. So the link for the video will be sent to everybody who wants to request for it. And I will explain how you do that at the end of the webinar, if you're patient. We've got one more speaker to wrap this up, and then we can actually uh, progress towards uh, enjoying the rest of our day and the rest of our week. It gives me absolute pleasure to invite our very last speaker for today, who is, um, I mean, she holds a PhD in chemistry from Lost Broad University in the UK. And she won a, a fellowship to, to, to the United Nations University in Tokyo, Japan, to study international cooperation and development and environmental change. She's also, she also, also obtained a postdoctoral fellowship uh, by the Korean government to continue her research in environmental monitoring at the International Research Center in Guangzhou Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea. Uh, she's also a Slumberger Foundation Faculty for the Future Fellowship Award winner. Currently, she's a senior lecturer in chemistry and the co-founder of the International Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability Research, ICEESR, at the University of Uyo in Nigeria. She's also the current president of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, OWSD, University of Uyo chapter. And her name is Dr. Uh, Edu Inam. She'll be speaking about partnership of research industry, but with a focus on our experiences, especially on the setting up of our center, but also on other collaborative work. Please, over to you, Edo. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Akan. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, let me start by thanking Keg and all the Recirculate team for giving me this opportunity to present. I'm really, really excited. I also want to thank all the speakers. They've, they're, they've been so fantastic with their presentation this morning. Um, it's really, really excited to be here, and I thank all our participants. Um, yeah, let me start by I'm talking about challenges, really. Um, let me just give a typical scenario, I'm like, ha like what happened like um, just this morning. Um, yesterday, we had um, torrential rain in the city of Uyu. And um, this morning, you, um, the power line, the internet were all down. And I asked myself, imagine you having a meeting, a nine o'clock meeting with an MD of a very big company who, are, who they are always very time conscious. 
and they are here in your office at nine o'clock, and then you come in, there's no power, there's no internet. How do you just begin? So these are some of the real um, challenges that um, researchers in Africa kind of face. But for me personally, I have made it a point of duty not to really focus more on challenges because if you want to direct your energy on challenges, then you may not necessarily be able to do anything. So for me this morning, I just want to share what um, in the midst of all the very difficult and challenges that we have here, what myself and my colleague have been able to achieve just at our own level as researchers and trying to partner with industry. So thank you. So I'd just like to briefly introduce our center. So the Center for Energy, the idea, we conceived the idea around 2020 just to make a difference, you know, just after receiving several training from Lancaster to the Recycle Commonwealth Fellowship and all the trainings I've attended, well, coming home, you know, you just want to make a difference. And so myself and my colleague, we you know, came together um, to start up this center. We got the approval from our university and then we had the groundbreaking of the main building. And currently we are into um, partnerships, seeking partnerships and linkages with um, similar centers and industry. And our mission and vision as stated there, and um, which you may look at it as being very ambitious, but I know that you also agree with me that a journey of a thousand miles always starts with just one step. And so this is our belief. We may not be able to achieve these ambitions even in our lifetime, but at least we are laying the foundation for future generation. And in terms of our, our core areas, you know, we ask ourselves, what are our challenges around this area? We are located at the Niger Delta region, where one of the all rich regions of the world, one of the richest delta in the world with oil and gas. But several years of oil exploration has left us with a lot of environmental damage in terms of air pollution, soil contamination, water contamination, and all of that. So we focus our key areas on some of these challenges that are relevant to our situation. And I just want to share before I go into my other slide of um, some of the challenges and opportunities, let me just highlight um, some of our partnerships just to encourage um, other researchers in other countries and even in my country. You do not need to wait until you operate at the scale of Lancaster or even at the scale of University of Benin where Professor, my senior colleague, elaborated, but you can just start something just with, an, with your colleague at your own scale. So um, my first collaboration um, was with the Ganji Institute of Science and Technology where I did my four-year postdoc there, and, and I had um, relationships that extended even when I returned to my country, and through this collaboration we've had a um, series of funded research programs, exchange students and staff exchange programs, and then we've been able, in terms of publications and meetings, we've had some very good publications and some very good outputs. And then the collaboration with Lancaster, and we have a collaborative research where we are looking at um, survey of um, pesticides in, in, uh, in Nigeria. So we are happy to be part of this research project, um, which is ongoing. And then um, we've had um, to show, we've had book chapters and we've had workshop and training. And then collaboration with Germany, the International Sustainable Chemistry Collaborative Center Germany, where we are collaborating in terms of looking at sustainable chemistry. And we've had um, a, a one collaborative project and um, a paper and um, some grants and the establishment of a sustainable green and sustainable chemistry laboratory in, in our center is ongoing. And then for me, we also have, so um, the, collaborating with American Chemical Society. I know um, when I ask ourselves, you know, in Nigeria, we have a strong, um, most universities have strong collaboration with Royal Society, even though I'm a member. But then when you look at your space and you know, you just want to identify oh, which, which organization or which who is ready now to work with you. And we found American Chemical Society, they were just coming into Nigeria newly. And so we um, keep into that opportunity. Uh, and then, 
So you're you're really breaking up, Edu. Your voice is uh, your audio is really bad. I think it's the connection. Operation and we are currently. So what do I do? Let me just try to continue. Right. So we have collaboration. So these are the SMEs. So not just sometimes we just not just research collaboration, but which try to set up engagements with and then from there that um, what areas we can um, collaborate for that. So we've done this with Greenwell, we've done it with Client. And so I quickly go into so when I talk Edu, could you turn off your video? Uh, my, my challenges and opportunities. I really want to like look at yes, please. Yes. Could you turn off turn off your turn off your video? It might help oh, with the okay, okay. we are struggling to hear you. Yeah. Right. Thank so. you. Can you turn off the video? Okay. Is my video okay? Does that sound better now? It yeah, sounds better. Are yes. you hearing me now? I can. Yes, we, we, we can hear you. Yes, but just in case it's it's breaking, it would be nice if you could just turn up the video so we can hear you clearly. That's better. Thank you. Oh. oh okay. Okay, so I've turned up the video. Okay. So where did okay? I think it was here with, with the SMEs. What other and further collaboration that can happen? And we've done that with Green Wealth Technology and with Clean Energy. And um in terms of looking at challenges challenges and opportunities. For me, I just want to look at it using um, SWOT analysis, where I look at the strength, the opportunities, the weaknesses, and the strengths, which is the core of uh, my core presentation for today. See, in terms of strengths, collaborations brings a diversified and competent workforce because, I mean, when uh, organizations know that, um, that you are collaborating with, especially centers that, are, um, that have better capability than yours and um, they think to kind of believe um, that you'll be able to deliver on certain projects and um, collaborations give you an opportunity to uh, link with reputable international institutions and it also gives you an opportunity to focus more on industry related researches instead of academic researches and for us it also helps us to harness the r d opportunities in the niger delta and then it also helps because traditionally and most of our universities are designed without them, um, without them um, thinking about industry co-location. So with collaboration, it helps to bring in um, new designs of buildings that will enhance uh, co-location and future partnerships. In terms of opportunities, being able to have tailored content and um, local content business solutions. In our country now, there's a local content bill that uh, businesses are struggling to um, comply with. So this is a very good opportunity here because when industry and university collaborate, then we can um, bring that local content into business solutions. And then for the industries that we partner with, they have the right of first refusal in terms of com commercialization. And then like um, Prof said, we have, um, we have big, we are, our unemployment is in um, double digits. So with collaboration, we can create new ventures to reduce unemployment. In terms of weaknesses, no, we, I mean, funding and revenue inflow is a big, is a challenge in terms of supporting infrastructure like power, like ICT, like um, in laboratory infrastructure is still a big challenge. So I look at that as weaknesses. And then in terms of having local manufacture of equipment, chemicals and materials, especially with COVID, where you have and where there's a lot of, um, where there's an increase, like um, the, the exchange rates has really, really gone bad for us. And 
So this really affects um, research because now um, if you don't have your local manufacture of chemicals and reagents, it becomes a challenge. And then I look at in terms of traits. Traits means we, there's a really um, challenging research in envir um, environment in Africa. Like we mentioned about policy, not having policy way that making it compulsory for researchers to collaborate with industry. And a highly competitive business climate, you know, by the time you, are, you spend time, you know, developing a product, you discover that you already you have um, a, the product has already been brought in. Maybe it's at a reduced cost and, and it's a foreign product and you're struggling to compete. So these are some of the and then policy framework and then finally insecurity. So for me, these are some of the challenges some of your and the opportunities that um, I, I find in in collaborations and then um, but then looking in the literature we've seen what are some of the benefits we have economic benefits we have social benefits and then um, other benefits as um, as listed there and um, and then and then I also like to share that when you're also thinking about collaboration you should also think about the risk that there's nothing without risk there's risk of conflict of interest, risk of compromise of academic integrity. There's the risk of inhibition of timely dissemination of research results. You want to publish and the industry partner is saying, oh, because they were the one that funded your project, you need to have, you need to keep it for three of years before you start um, publish, publishing or before you make public. So those are some of the risks. And then diversion of academic resources from, institu inst from institution loss of faculty and staff to partners, financial obligations and cost resulting from partnerships, increased support requirements. So these are some of the risks that you may want to um, think about when you are entering into research industry partnership. And um, so finally, I just want to showcase some of our publications and then these are just some of the activities and true partnerships that we have been able to carry out. So thank you. That was very short and sweet, Edu. Absolutely fantastic. See, but it's actually a, a testament to the fact that if you intentionally decide to do this, and bearing in mind uh, some, if you like, a uh, really good case studies of, of kind of pits, pit, pits to avoid and lessons learned, you can actually make it work. And I think it kind of behooves on every individual listening uh, in on the, on the call that you should understand that partnerships can be driven institutionally. But I guess the question then is, what about when there is no institutional engagement? Can partnership be driven as an individual? I, th I think it can. I mean, it, it, might, it might be a bit more stressful, a bit more, um, um, more onerous on you, but the point is, if you understand the benefit of partnerships, you can drive it. You can become the champion in your own institution, the champion in your own organization, towards driving partnerships. I think we can just go straight to the last set of Mentimeter questions, wrap it up. And, and I'm conscious that we've gone past time today, but obviously you are aware that we had several issues with the internet connectivity uh, throughout the session, so I do apologize for that. So the first set of questions, look at the chat section, there is a link, and quickly run through these questions, and then we can wrap it up. Thank you very much. So the first question, actually, it's uh, is based on Maximus's last presentation around the Pan-African Framework for Climate Change. And the question is, partnerships can help with this sharing of data to improve Africa's understanding of climate change. But what is stopping this from happening? We've got some options, <clears throat> I think. So uh, partnership, partnership is vital. So I guess if you know, just have any response, you can just write it in a word or a phrase. Let's catch up some people's, uh, kind of, uh, your views or your thoughts. So partnership can help with sharing of data to improve Africa's understanding of climate change. Why is it not happening? What do you think? So I, so in, 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 in that link, you would find a space to actually um, Share your thoughts on that. What, what are people thinking? Ineffective communication, someone says. So there's no effective communication. That's why it's not happening. Anybody else? What is? What are people thinking?
lack of awareness. Interesting, that's lack of awareness of climate change impacts or lack of awareness of projects that are happening around climate change. There's a reluctance to share data. Edu was just talking about the fact that when you have some cases of industry academia partnerships, if the industry partner is a funder, they say, well, you can share that data for another three or four years. There's a conflict of interest. That's actually a very interesting point. Conflict of interest that stops the sharing of data because people are thinking, well, uh, well, uh, it kind of conflicts my current job. Lack of finances. That's interesting. So even though you have the data, the dissemination of data requires some resource base to make it happen. <laughs> I like that response very much. There is no data to share. I wonder who said that. <laughs> So, so the, 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 that that observer thinks that well, in some cases the data is not is just not there, and you're very correct. It's just not there. As living in denial. So even when you know things are happening, you pretend as if they are not. Very very true. Thank you for that. Partner mistrust. You cannot do partnership without trust. It's absolutely fundamental because at the end of the day, it's about relationships. Implementation, that's fantastic to know. Um, lack of awareness, people working in silos. We've spoken about different dimensions or segments of society and people not working together. It's quite a big, a big, a big ho ho huddle towards sharing data. Let's go to the next question. Thanks, guys, for your feedback on that. That's fantastic. Really good to see. Next question. I think it's a, it's a very interesting one. Now, what is responsible for Africa's lag in the uptake? of renewable energy solutions. We have incredible sunlight. We have amazing winds. We have amazing cost for wind energy. We have, I mean, the list goes on. Africa has got renewable energy resources, but why are we still lagging behind in the uptake of renewable energy solutions? What do you think? The lack of data, the weak government policies, so that this continuous dependence on fossil fuels or just a poor research foundation. There seems to be a, a, a preference, and, and, and I mean, I, I'm inclined to agree, a preference towards a weak government policies. Some African countries don't even have renewable energy policies. And, and when, even when they do, they remain theoretical policies that, are, that are, don't have the practical dimensions of its implementation it becomes an issue. So thanks for the room. I think uh, um, I can see nobody's talking about lack of data. So there's weak government policies and there's this, this continuous dependence on fossil fuels. I think in the last uh, three, four years, different African governments have started diverting towards renewable energy solutions because of the crash in oil and gas prices. So it's maybe it's a wake up call in, in, in some cases. Thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies for your participation. Next question, please. We are, we are finishing now, don't worry. We are, we are wrapping up now. Next question, please. Okay, now this is, a, this is an interesting one. What is the most prevalent risk to research partnerships? I think Edu spoke about a few of those in her, in her, in her talk. What is the most prevalent risk to research partnerships? Conflict of interest? Are you scared you will lose your faculty to somebody else or a new partner? Diversion of your resources? Some people will say, well, I am a researcher and academic, first and foremost to teach. And so research and partnerships is a secondary issue. That's, that's also the case in some cases. So people have got, a, if you like, a, a preference towards the fact that there is a lot of conflict of interest, uh, especially for researchers, which is which kind of stalls the growth and development of research partnerships, and that's understandable. I guess the whole point of this question is to get you thinking about what you've heard today, how might you engage, what are the issues, and how might they be resolved? It's a, it's a bit of a, a basis for some interaction with the audience. Thank you very much for the interactions, yeah? And then the last question now, Alan, fantastic. The very last question. Okay, good. So wh why would you even do partnerships in the first place? Why do you care? Why is it important? What is the biggest incentive to partnerships? I think Lancaster has spoken about the Lancaster partnership experience. Edu has spoken, spoken about her research experience. Um, Feli spoke about her uh, partnership experience. Maximus and even um, and, and, and even and even Keck 
alluded to this. And all of these partnerships would have different drivers and incentives. In your own view, from your own institution, as an academic, an entrepreneur, a professional, what in your case would be the biggest incentive to you driving partnerships? What do you think? Okay, so I, I would imagine there are a lot more researchers in the room. And so the, the preference seems to be the impact of research work, which obviously makes sense. Um, partnership can give alternative revenue sources. That's true. I mean, how can you be looking for money and not partnering with industry partners who actually have money? It doesn't make any sense. And so there's a basis for alternative revenues. There is a strong basis for high profile and status. Part of the internationalization framework is partnership. How many international partners do you liaise, connect and engage with? And also even increase clientele base. So you can partner with individuals, organizations to increase your, your clientele base. But I think because the room has got predominantly researchers, the driver is research impact of your work. And that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we can call it off now. I I, I do apologize again for the delays in the, in the different connections. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you had a good time listening to our different speakers and for your engagement. If you want to receive a copy of the certificate of, of, of participation from Lancaster University and the project, please, if you can click on the link on the chat, fill a very short questionnaire which just asks for how you want your name to be shown on the certificate so that we can send you the certificate and also the recording for the session. It might be most of you want to mull over what you've heard today, which I think is advisable. So we, there'll be a recording, but please click that link, fill a very short questionnaire, please, which includes taking your name and your email as you want it to appear on certificate. And we will send you your certificate of participation, but also a link to watch the recorded video. I want to call on Keck for his last words as we close this up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Akan. So I'd just like to start by thanking all of the presenters uh, for really very, very interesting and diverse uh, presentations. And it just it just shows you the complexity and the scope that exists within, you know, international collaboration. And I think um, what also, I mean, optimistically, of course, is that it is possible, you know, um, and all you need is a, one or two very willing people to actually drive these things forward. And, uh, and uh, you know, we hope that in bringing people together in these webinars that we've been running for quite some time now, that that will continue to facilitate new uh, collaborations or, or develop further existing collaborations um, across the piece, not only in terms of you know, research, you know, I can make the point rightly that there are a lot of researchers in the room, but also um, for more expansive uh, collaborations outside of academia into uh, uh, the private sector, government and policy, and of course, um, our communities as well. So, so thank you one and all, and thank you for attending as well. For me, it's been extremely illuminating and I hope you've enjoyed it too. And with that, I will say goodbye and I'll hand back to Akan. Thank you very Thank much. You so I want, I want to give a, a, a very quick action point, if I may, just <clears throat> kind of occur to me. Today we've spoken a lot about institutional partnership, but most of folks on the call are individuals, your professionals, your academics. So what can you do? I've got a few ideas. How about you start today by updating your LinkedIn profile? That would be a good start. If I ask Professor Lawrence is the money, for example, I'm not picking on you, Prof, but I want to make a point. Professor That's Lawrence okay. C, Professor, Professor Lawrence CV is about 40 pages. I've seen the CV, it's that long. But I'm sure, for example, his LinkedIn profile is less than two pages. So maybe individually, as a way to showcase what you do, because LinkedIn, for example, is the biggest. I, I'm not promoting LinkedIn, and trust me, I'm, I'm not a staff of LinkedIn. But my point is. LinkedIn is the biggest professional network in the world. It's a really amazing place to find partners. Do a Google, a small search on that search button. 
of which partners do what you do in what field, in your area, as simple as that. So start today on your own partnership journey. Begin by updating your LinkedIn profile. A little copy and paste of your CV can put it together and intentionally and strategically find partners to collaborate with and enjoy the benefit. On that note, thank you very much, everyone, and have an incredible week. And God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Jake. Bye, bye Prof. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, I can. Another, Thank another you, excellent bye. job. Thanks, Jake. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice seeing you here. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank well you, Max Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Edu. Thank you, Feli. You guys are phenomenal. Thanks, Vajila, Constance, for attending. Thanks, Paul, <laughs> Diane, Samuel, and Alan on the background. You guys always do an incredible job. Thanks to our partners in Malawi, Botswana. I can see all the of you from Kenya. I can see Carolyn Torua. I can see folks from Ghana, Nigeria. It's a partnership heaven. Come on. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, guys, have a good week. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good week. Bye.